Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. And welcome to today's dark reading webinar, Managing Identity in the Cloud. It's sponsored by Radiant Logic and broadcast by Informa. My name is Becky Bracken. I'm an editor with Dark Reading, and I'll be your moderator today. But before we get started, we have just a few announcements. The webinar is designed to be interactive. The dock of widgets at the bottom of your screen will allow you to learn about today's speakers, download resources, share the webinar via social media outlets, and participate in the Q&A that takes place at the end of our presentation. The slides will advance automatically throughout the event. You may also download a copy of the slides via the resources widget. Toward the end of our webinar, we'll ask you to provide feedback via the survey widget, which is found at the bottom of your screen. Please take a minute to fill this out before leaving us today, as your feedback will provide us with valuable information on how we can improve future events. Lastly, if you're experiencing any technical problems, please click the help widget found at the bottom of your screen, or you can type your issue into the Q&A area, and we'll be glad to offer you one-on-one -on -one assistance. Now on to our presentation, Managing Identity in the Cloud. Discussing today's topic is Jonathan Kerr with Winefish Tech Advisors, Wade Ellery, Chief Field Technology Officer at Radiant Logic. If you want to learn more about our speakers, you can find their bios in the speaker bio widget on the screen. And again, if you want to ask our speakers any questions, you can just type that into the Q&A area on your screen. So with that, I would like to hand things over to Jonathan Kerr. Did we lose Jonathan? All right. Hello, everybody. Thank you. Oh, for there that. he is. Sorry. Excellent. There I am. Um, hello, everybody. It's good to be back again. And thank you very much for uh, taking the time. Uh, we're going to talk today about managing identity in the cloud. And as I said, I hope we'll get some good questions and discussions at the end of the session. Um, what, why do we care about IAM? I've looked at this for a while, um, something I used to cover um, quite extensively when I was uh, uh, an industry analyst. And um, as the slide says, it's the key to how business generates revenue and supports a flexible and resilient business model. Why is it the key? Because we need to know who's going to pay us. Um, if we have fraudsters, then um, we have um, them um, preventing themselves from um, uh, catching, they're preventing themselves from being detected by subverting and assuming other identities. So what I'd like to talk to you today is essentially what IBM, what IAM looks like in a cloudy future, uh, what I see the ingredients of a successful IAM architecture to be, and indeed, what is the future state. Without further ado. What's the ethos of IAM? Well, it is the implementation of a pervasive fabric. And the reason I like that term, um, I'm going to claim um, some partial credit for it. Um, backstage one day before going on to an, uh, a Gartner keynote stage, um, I was uh, thinking about this and I was talking to someone and said, gosh, you know, IAM is everywhere. It supports us and it's like, and someone said, is it, you know, you made a couple of Star Wars jokes. But I said, no, it's like a fabric. It pervades everything. It's in everything. But if it's doing its job right, we never notice it. We never see it. And so it is this idea. It is securely supporting zero trust identity assertions from employees, from supply chains, and possibly our customers as well, to facilitate trusted transactions. And that's kind of my, yeah, my little um example of it, or my little definition of it. Use cases for me abound. We have the workforce. We have the consumer. We have this whole mishmash of embedded systems of Internet of Things that we know is going to be, again, increasingly needing to be identified so that it can, again, transact with our you know, traditional systems. We have our supply chain. 
And of course, there's a few things about our supply chain. There's the traditional manufacturing supply chain or the retail supply chain, which is about you know, moving goods from A to B. But we're also now seeing other supply chains. We are all now very aware that the software supply chain and having a trust model so that we know a piece of software or a software module is coming from the dev team that it's supposed to come from and has not been altered on the way. We now know this is important. And all of this is a function of identity and access management. So as I said, I want to delve into this idea of IAM in a cloudy future. And why do I use that term? Well, what is this IAM thing? And we talked about it. And again, I've got, you know, pulled out the Gartner definition. Um, and again, there's a lot of text on here, but don't worry, you can download this presentation afterwards. Um, so don't feel you have to screenshot or write it down. Identity and access management is a security discipline that enables the right individuals to access the right resources at the right times for the right reasons. And it's addressing that mission critical need to ensure appropriate access to resources across increasingly heterogeneous technology environments, of which, of course, the cloud is the latest and greatest. And for that, we have the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, we have the, um, uh, in the cloud, but also now we're looking at hybrid multi-cloud. We're looking at, um, again, cloud platforms that may be not only multi-instance, multi-zone, multi-availability, but also now, as I say, different cloud providers as well, including perhaps cloud instances that we've actually developed and deployed in our traditional data centers. Which is, again, it's kind of interesting as well. So IAM needs to be that pervasive fabric that will work in all those different environments. And so, yeah, identity, access, what do we mean by that? Um, identity is about authentication. And um, we, in that case, have to provide credentials that prove we are who we say we really are. And um, there's been a lot of debate about this. And especially, um, actually, um, in many consumer-based IAM cases, but also some workforce cases, um, it's no longer a binary question. No longer you provided the credentials. We now, you know, we now believe you are say you say you are. But instead, we're now saying, well, on the balance of probability, is it more likely this is really Jonathan Care, or is it more likely it's something or someone pretending to be Jonathan? And that's interesting because that changes that whole paradigm. And we're going to talk a little bit, you know, frankly, about why passwords really should go away, but they're not likely to. Um, the second part, though, is access. What, if I'm really Jonathan Care, what am I allowed to do? Well, a lot of it depends on the context. So my bank, for example, if I uh, log in from a familiar and well-trusted connection, my bank's consumer identity and access management system will say, oh, okay, we're going to let him view his balance. We're going to let Jonathan Care pay somebody he's already paid before. Um, but if I'm logging in from an unknown connection, they'll say, you know, actually, we're going to restrict access to the dangerous functions like setting up and paying a new beneficiary. Because um, obviously that's the one the force is like. So authorization becomes important. And authorization is dynamic. It depends on your role. And I described my role there as a customer of a bank. Um, but it depends on your role. It depends on the context that you're accessing. It depends on the risk associated with your authentication assertion. And so all of those things, these are all dynamic and they all interplay. What are we able to do? What capabilities are we exposed to and presented with as users of a system? And again, that's whether it's workforce or consumer. And so management, the third kind of piece in that uh, word salad, that puzzle, it's the system of managing these identities in some kind of IT network or platform, which again can be internally or externally facing. 
and it's breaking down identities into groups, roles, and other professional personal details. And if you want a mental picture, the one I really like is that myself, Wade, Becky, we three are all nodes on an identity graph. And each of us as a node has different attributes and facets. And for example, then, the process of identification is measuring the link between where I am on an identity graph and where, for example, Becky or Wade are. Yeah? So this also means that the perception of identity can change depending on those relationships. So Becky and Wade know me as a technologist, dark reading presenter and writer, uh, as I said, cybersecurity advisor, and so on and so forth. The person working in my local supermarket knows me as somebody who goes in there and buys some um, some salad, some sourdough bread, and you know, maybe uh, um, a couple of bottles of beer on a weekend. And so their perception of me as my of my identity is very different again because it's contextualized. So. What can we do with all of this? Well, there's another aspect, of course, which is the things. Now, I've just been talking about people. Me, Wade, and Becky, we're all people. Um, however, we're increasingly thinking about how we identify things, how we identify elements in, for example, an automotive system or an industrial context or a, a retail store if we have a smart pricing uh, system. So all of these can be, again, uh, elements in an Internet of Things. And, of course, when we're thinking about the cloud, a lot of these things or soft, autonomous software agents have no physical presence. So how do we identify it? Well, I'd say there's a couple of ways, and we've seen these being tried out there. And I've kind of characterized it as, well, if we have an autonomous software agent, a thing, we can identify it the way that um, people identify a dog. You know, that dog belongs to Jonathan, or that dog belongs to Becky or Wade. Um, so the associated human over then bears some responsibility for being um, responsible for the activity and behavior. And of course, there was a recent, well, a couple of years ago now, uh, experiment where um, some uh, researchers decide to uh, equip their bot with some um, some cash and, or some Bitcoin, and they sent it out onto the dark web to see what it could buy. And this thing bought some drugs, which they then found they were responsible for. Um, so, again, is that a valid model? Do we say, well, the human is responsible for the thing, and that's how we identify it? But we can also identify it the way we identify a vehicle. We can say there is an assigned identifier, which at the point of creation is stamped into the chassis, the vehicle identification number as it is in automotive, or um, you know, etched onto the windscreen or some other way. And um, what happens then? Well, again, that's fine. But in the world of software, where everything is essentially fairly mutable, what, how do we identify it then? So we have to actually look at other ways of identifying things. And, of course, one of the things we've seen, and it's been um, certainly in the financial uh, services world, it's actually quite common now to have uh, consumer identity and access management systems that identify people partly by their behavior. So the way that I move my mouse, the way I type on my keyboard, is part of my behavioral profile, but also my transactions can become uh, part of my profile as well. And I remember I did a, uh, a conference in Las Vegas. It was kind of fun. Um, I stood up and I said, you know, what if uh, my normal you know, grocery shop of lettuce and some eggs and some salad and some bread, some sourdough bread, and I said, what if that only suddenly got changed to uh, buying a crate of whiskey? And someone said, well, you'd be an analyst then. Made the audience laugh. Um, but, of course, there's another aspect of this as well. I talked about Becky, myself, and Wade all being nodes on an identity graph. Well, of course, we've all got connections to each other now, um, partly because we've been uh, here today, 
Um, and that's another way we can identify a thing, an autonomous agent. We can actually say we can identify it by where it associates with its peer relationships. So having put all that in play and having thought about these concepts, why move to the cloud? Well, there's all the reasons, of course, because everything else is moving to the cloud. We don't really want our IAM systems to be the last thing in the data center. But let's take a closer look. We traditionally used on-premises IAM to manage identity and access policies, and that was fine. But now we're not yet in the data centers. We're out in the cloud. We're using um, platforms that we then run our own applications on. Or we're going to a sales force, or we're going to any of these, or a, any of the other application providers, and we're using their systems. But again, we still want to authenticate our people to that. And of course, again, if you're in retail, um, so when I authenticate to Netflix, I'm using their consumer IAM system to, um, and they figure out based on where I live, based on what I'm paying them, what I'm allowed to watch, what capabilities I have. And so it's getting more complex because Netflix is a simple example. But let's say, for example, as my, my brand new Google TV is telling me, I have access to, I don't know, Disney, and I have access to Netflix, and I have access to all these things. And based on a single identity, these interoperating applications figure out what capabilities, what content I'm going to be offered, again, based on my context, my, the country that I'm in. <clears throat> A cloud-based IAM system is actually quite attractive because it can support these new, different ways of application and service delivery. But at the same time, where we still have something that's living on-premises, there's no reason why we can't say that's where the IAM system is and point to an API in the cloud. So adopting these cloud-based identity as a service, and again, um, my Gartner colleagues will be uh, upset because I'm using an old term they've deprecated, which is IDAS, because everything's in the cloud now. But if we adopt identity of a service and other cloud IAM solutions, it's a very logical step. We serve our digital nomads. We serve these hybrid applications I was just alluding to. And of course, any distributed data resources, quite often now, data resources are becoming sharded across different services and, um, and indeed yeah, different data types. And so these cloud IAM solutions can deliver seamlessly to all of those use cases. And as I said, machines are people too. And I know there are companies out there that are looking very seriously at the world of machine identity management. Mostly machines tend to identify using mutual authentication certificates. But again, we come to the question of how do you trust? And again, you know, uh, people like me make jokes like, well, maybe 2023 is finally going to be the year of PKI, um, which makes the PKI vendors very happy. But again, what if your machine is purely software? How do we develop a chain of trust for something so mutable? What if your machine is part of a vehicle or, again, a sewage utility? And, of course, there are very different requirements there. A vehicle must have continuity of operation. You do not want to find it suddenly stopping when you're doing 60 miles an hour on the freeway. Um, a sewage utility should not take a long time to replace a part because you need to configure a complex identity service. You need to pull out the broken parts, which may include some uh, monitoring capability, and then put in the, uh, the, new, the new part without excessive downtime. Like I said, consumer IAM is a very different model. Um, we have varying authentication models. We all know about passwords. I've mentioned behavioral access, which is becoming an increasing part of consumer IAM. And of course, this builds into this risk-based authentication model. How likely is it really Jonathan Care? Federation across different systems so we can orchestrate service delivery to a consumer is becoming an increasingly common requirement. Social identity, so again, ease of use, convenience, so I'm not having to use create credentials created for me. Uh, I'm just using uh, my Google ID, my Facebook ID, or anything else. And of course, getting the credential recovery problem wrong 
is a great way of seeing customers compromise. And we've all seen the stories um, you know, that uh, someone's Gmail account gets compromised and all of a sudden, hey, presto, there goes your bank account. Hey, presto, there goes your iTunes account. And of course, um, iTunes is an interesting case in itself. You know, Back in the day when it first came along, the worst you could do was buy down some uh, bad pop music, which some might say was a crime in itself. However, now it is a payment system with Apple Pay. Um, we expose our payment details, our banking, to abuse if, again, our credentials are compromised. And there's this other problem which there are companies now emerging to solve, which is this transitive trust issue. Um, I mentioned Gmail. Well, I have a number of services that authenticate through OAuth to my Gmail account. I have others that authenticate to my Twitter account. I have others and, and so on and so on. And of course, some of these are cloud services which rely on other cloud services. So if at any point there's a breakdown in, for example, the software supply chain, if there's a exploitable bug, then all of a sudden that transitive trust issue becomes an account takeover issue. So I wanted to talk to as well about ingredients of what I see a successful IAM architecture look like. Um, and again, you know, the very basics, I guess, of is the security assertion markup language. This is the common language between different IAM systems. It allows them to interoperate and orchestrate their capabilities. Um, it allows authentication assertions to be passed between one system and another. And it's essentially, it's a fundamental, as a lingua franca, it's a fundamental common language between the various IAM platforms and systems that are out there. Um, I've mentioned OAuth, and I want to talk about it in a bit more detail. It's very similar to systems like um, OpenID, which I'll talk about in a moment, and SAML, in that it can facilitate authentication across multiple systems. What it also does, it gives us the ability to authorize different resources, both at system and application level. And again, the challenge comes when we grant permissions and they get chained across disparate cloud entities. Because if we have an accident, you know, if there's a software supply issue or you know, something else happens, we then see exposure of data. We see, frankly, arbitrary rec remote code execution, which can be, again, quite severe. So let's talk a little about uh, yeah, OIC or OIDC. Um, it's this federated identity system. Um, Major social platforms use it, uh, Google or Yahoo for being two, Facebook being another. Um, they facilitate standardized authentication across multiple platforms. And obviously, um, you know, Jan Rain was his company formed to uh, make use of it. And then um, the, um, you know, the, uh, that was then obviously then sold to, I believe, Akamai. Um, so again, Akamai are building this, not only the, uh, uh, if you like, data um, caching at the edge, but now identity is becoming an edge service as well. Um, OAuth is distinct and complementary to OpenID, but it becomes important when we're starting to think about access delegation. What will I let a, an autonomous software agent, and you're going to hear use Calendly or Motion, I certainly do, and they have access to my Google Calendar they have access to my Office 365 calendars and a few others as well. And so anybody who books time with me can book time automatically, which is great. But if obviously it ever gets abused, I find an awful lot of calendar spam in my system. Um, and as I say, it's an authentication layer built on top of OAuth 2.0. And it again facilitates and enables this idea of cloud-based service access management. It's one of the key things that allows us to use the cloud in the way we do today. I'll talk about this as well, um, LDAP. Um, it's been around for years, since the 1990s. Um, and it supports distributed access to connect directors, including handle authentication. Authority. It sounds great. In fact, you know, a lot of people say, well, if we've got that, why do we bother with any other types of authentication systems? Well, it's fairly limited. Uh, as I said, it's uh, built around the idea of open source um, protocol, and it's kind of based on the idea 
that my credentials are my username and my password. Um, so if, for example, your bank uses partial passwords for authentication, uh, if they use uh, mobile push, uh, if they use anything like that, then um, LDAP doesn't support it. And I've actually seen um, uh, a project I was involved in, I'll try and use my words carefully, um, a large credit card agency that isn't MasterCard, um, had um, you know, one of these terribly clever people, uh, degrees in cryptography, um, formerly worked in the uh, in the national security agencies of the country I'm in, and uh, developed a system for authentication of consumers based on LDAP. And um, yes, this had to be then ripped out and started again because LDAP doesn't support the kind of authentication systems that project needs support. So it's quite important and to realize what it can do or can't do, and certainly in terms of native authentication. But it does work well at providing authorization at those roles and, again, expected contexts because it can support all these attributes of, again, entries in the directory. What I'd like to do is to close off with what I see the future states of IAM. We're going, and again, this is me um, you know, being an analyst again, if you like. Uh, I think we're going to see a couple of things happen. First of all, consumer IAM and workforce IAM, right now they get treated as much the same sort of thing. But I think we're going to see them become two separate markets. We're also going to see an increased focus on identifying things and machines as well as entities. I don't think passwords are going to go away. And uh, one of my friends um, is responsible for building one of the first uh, password crackers called Appropriate Enough Crack. Um, and uh, he says, well, no, it'll never go away. It'll always, we'll, there will always be a need for this. But they should go away because people are not good with passwords. We know that people tend to <clears throat> use the same passwords for their Facebook account and their email account. And if one gets compromised, guess what? So does the other. And we know this because obviously there's plenty of password credential databases out there in the wild that confirm this fact. Um, so passwords won't go away because they are convenient, but they should. And I'd like to see us all taking a conscious leap to at least using multi-factor authentication or using repeated factors like um, um, Google Auth, for those of you who you know, tapped in those six-figure numbers. If you can, enable it on everything. That's my top tip for the day. Um, IAM programs will become more lightweight. We had a kind of a bad habit of building these huge monolithic heavyweight, multi-year, multi-stage programs um, that frankly didn't deliver and fell apart under their own weight. What we're going to see, I believe, we're going to see more and more um, drop in what my, my American friends call canned components, basically things you can drop in and just they just work. And that, of course, suits very much the cloud environment where we just want stuff to bang, bang, bang and work. Um, I think something else we're going to see and... Uh, um, you know, this is, I'm going to try and steal a march on my, uh, my former colleagues now. There's this thing that people are starting to talk about called identity threat detection and response. I think this is stuff we already know. It's IAM. It's identity proofing. And it's fraud detection, which we've seen in banking, obviously. We've seen in retail. But we've also seen in the enterprise in the guise of UEBA. And all of these things are going to start converging and become these identity threat detection and response systems. So with that, um, thank you very much for listening. What I'd now like to do is hand over to my friend and colleague, Wade, who is going to talk to you about what they're doing at Radiant Logic. Excellent. Thank you, Jonathan. I appreciate your presentation very much. You covered a lot of territory there. I'm going to see if I can sort of zoom in a little bit here around um, the idea of the cloud and where Radiant Logic uh, sees the industry moving, and then where we can be of assistance, where we can help with organizations that uh, allow us to be able to manage that cloud more effectively, understanding the context of that in relation to what we uh, normally have. So, 
What is the cloud? Well, it's your data on someone else's servers and no longer in your data center, but down the street in someone else's building. It's not a magical place where things automatically happen in, in wonderful ways that, that re remove all the challenges you had previously. In many ways, it's the same challenges you have today on an on-premise environment, except that it's in another facility that you don't have as much direct control of. So why is the cloud then such a attractive environment? Well, attractive to whom? If you talk to CEOs, CFOs, and CIOs, there's a perceived cost savings. There's a sense that I'm gonna save a tremendous amount of money if I shut down this big building that has a giant electrical bill and an air conditioning bill and security requirements and all this hardware I had to buy. If I can eliminate that hard dollar cost of that or that facility, I must be saving money. I can just do it on a pay-as-you-go basis. I can scale more easily to my requirements if I can do something on a, a lease as, as opposed to a buy. Now, if you're a CISO, there's a perception of increased security. I've heard many people say, well, Microsoft and AWS and, and Google can build a much more secure data center and infrastructure and, and uh, security plane than I can internally. They've got unlimited resources and skills. So I'm just going to piggyback on their security model. And then for the director of IT, it comes down to one simple thing. If I never have to patch a Windows server again in my life, it's worth it. Where do I sign up? Because the treasury, the time, the consumed resources and just keeping uh, current patches on Windows servers or Linux platforms or applications got to be onerous for many organizations and they look for any way to remove that. So that made the cloud very attractive. But then you have to understand what type of cloud are we talking about? And there are three major areas. There's the SaaS applications. Whoa, let me let that slide build out all the way. There we go, sorry about that. Got ahead of myself. There we go, SaaS applications. These are the applications in your environment that are hosting application functionality and a copy of your user information on someone else's platform that you were really removed from. And you're basically just using their software as a service for you to be able to do the work you need to do. If you use Salesforce, you use all their tools to manage your customers, but you don't have to manage any of the infrastructure. You just give them the data and trust that it's all taken care of. This is a whole area and really the first part of the cloud migration that we made and one that's fairly mature today. We've gotten to SAML and OIDC, as Jonathan mentioned, for access control. These are fairly well-managed infrastructures. Then there's identity as a service. This is a recognition that if I'm going to the cloud, I'm getting off my data center I have to find a place to put my identities for all my applications that are not SaaS based or that I'm going to be able to use to get access to those SaaS based applications. I'm in essence replacing what traditionally was my on-premise AD or LDAP directory with a cloud-based AD or LDAP directory or some version of that. Now I'm trading one vendor's product for another vendor's product. And the challenge here is that that information can get stuck inside that infrastructure. So if I bring all my accounts into Azure or into Okta, they're very available and very usable for things that Azure and Okta want to do, but they're difficult to get that data out again to use it for something else. So this is a, a point solution for a particular purpose, and most of it has to do with offering access to that software as a service platform that we saw a minute ago. Now, the other piece here that I can build out is infrastructure as a service. And this is all the infrastructure I had on premise in my data center. I'm gonna spin up servers now in my cloud vendors or my cloud providers. And again, there's the Oracle cloud at the bottom. I used to make this joke rather you know, commonly. I'll do it a little bit here. If you see an Oracle cloud, let me know. Still not quite sure where that one is. But these infrastructures let you spin up server environments, instances, virtual machines, uh, Kubernetes environments, and then run your software, your applications, your infrastructure, your databases in their environment. Again, in a, in a building down the street with someone else paying for the air conditioning and the internet access. But this is a way to move and lift your infrastructure out if you actually want to turn the lights off on your own terrestrial data centers. So this is a combination of, of three major planes that end up building this hybrid world. 
not only a hybrid world in that I'm in a SaaS environment, I'm in an IDAS environment, I'm in an infrastructure as a service environment, but I'm in Google, I'm in AWS, I'm in, I'm in uh, the other guy, <laughs> Azure. And then uh, at the same time, I still have resources on premise. I'm still dealing with the fact that I have one foot on the boat and one foot on the dock. And it's really difficult for most of the customers we've talked to to completely eliminate on-premise infrastructure. If you're a small company that started in the last five years, you're all built on cloud-based applications, you're under 3,000 people, you're probably able to run in a full cloud model. But if you're a large manufacturing organization, if you've got a large distributed physical environment like a franchise uh, food services company or a hospital where you have actual facilities that people have to go into and work in, you have a much harder time getting all the data and all the infrastructure from your IT department out of your own environment and up into the cloud. So you're gonna be working in this combined model here the challenge becomes, as, as Jonathan pointed out earlier, identity information, identity and access management is key to the functions of how we make money. It is the key to how business runs. It is the silent worker in the back that's doing all the turning of the cranks and making sure that the wheels run so that everything else works. And if you take identity out of the equation, things collapse very quickly. It's a security concern, but it's also a business and functional concern. So what happens when I scatter my infrastructure into multiple cloud vendors, on-premise and other places? I need a way to make identity ubiquitously available in every environment and contained in that environment, but also relative to what information I need to share in what location. I may have data in Azure that I need an AWS to do additional work with access to resources in AWS that I wanna make sure that data is available. I may have a data on the ground in Germany that can't leave on the ground in Germany. So I make sure that data doesn't get moved up into Azure or moved up into Google. So I need to be able to master this data, not only make it available in all these locales, but also control when that information is shared between my hybrid on-premise multi-cloud environment and recognize that things are constantly changing. So when a source of truth is updated, when a user's record in HR is changed, when someone's access in Azure is modified, if that change has an effect someplace else, that change needs to ripple out across the infrastructure. And this is one of the places that Radiant Logic can play, that Radiant Logic can bring value to the market, is we can be that ubiquitous vendor independent, cloud independent, data independent fabric that knits together all the identity data that you need in order to do the work you want to do across this hybrid world. So the, the challenge is that I still need to have all the operational components in the cloud that I had on premise. I still need to have an access management layer. I have an Azure or an Octo or a Ping or a Forge Rock or some access management layer there doing credential authentication, two-factor authentication, doing user authorization. More and more, I'm moving now towards policy-based access control, plain ID and other platforms. I need to manage my customers more and more now in the cloud. That's a tremendous amount of customer database information that's sitting back in the legacy platforms. My IGA system needs to still manage access control governance. There are still regulations and reporting requirements, segregation of duties policies that have to be enforced regardless of whether my data moves to the cloud. Again, the cloud doesn't solve all my problems magically. It's just a different building that I take my problems to and I deal with them at a little bit farther distance than I used to. PAM, AI and machine learning, all these components that are part of the identity infrastructure will live now both on-premise for some functions and in the cloud for other functions. And at the same time, I'm bringing more cloud-based challenges to the table. Now I have infrastructure in the cloud that has privileged accounts in AWS that manages AWS resources, privileged accounts inside Azure that manages Azure server resources and databases and infrastructure. I need to now manage those identities like I used to manage domain admin accounts on my on-premise AD in a privileged account management system that recognizes the cloud sources in addition to on-premise sources. So 
my problem got more complex as I moved to the cloud. And this becomes very onerous because if I do this on a one-to-one -one basis, if I write individual bridges and connectors and try and rationalize the data from all these sources that are both on-premise and in the cloud to all these consumers of the identity data that are both on-premise and the cloud, I'm going to have a very brittle infrastructure that's going to break. And as Jonathan mentioned, that's the challenge. This, this infrastructure can come apart. If I do this monolithic giant single try to solve it all problem, I'm going to end up in a model where my sprawl of the information is going to hamper my ability to operate. I need to have a robust system that can bring all this information together. And this is where Radiant Logic comes into play. You have your sources of data, you have all your consumers of data, and instead of having all that crisscross, you have a abstraction layer that sits in between the sources of information, whether they're on-premise and in the cloud, and all that consumer of identity data, and that abstraction layer in Radiant Logic allows you to correlate, aggregate, normalize, clean up, prepare, transform, associate all the data from all the different endpoints, and then create individual views of that information tailored to the requirements of these particular applications so that you can see in the application itself the data that you need to function from an IGA standpoint. This is an identity data fabric here feeding an identity fabric and this provides you with a complete and holistic model and method for accessing the data in this particular systems and models. So as I move forward here, you'll notice that all the vendors that consume identity data that you're used to working with on-premise, these are the same vendors you're taking up into the cloud to manage your identity infrastructure. They still need access to identity data. They are the identity data fabric, excuse me, the identity fabric fed by the identity data fabric, this is Radiant Logic. Now, as Jonathan mentioned, you have a number of protocols out there. The nice thing about Radiant is we're schema agnostic, we're vendor agnostic, we're protocol agnostic. We'll talk REST or SKIM or LDAP or JDBC. However, the data needs to be consumed or is exposed, flat files, it doesn't matter to us. We're the United Nations. We talk with every nation. We translate into the language that the endpoint wants to hear and can understand and we make data ubiquitously available and actionable across the system. So this is a critical component and it gives you an opportunity now as you start to move to the cloud to do some of the work you need to do up front. You wanna take this opportunity to really start to hone in on cleaning up this identity data. And any data is the fuel that runs the engines of your identity infrastructure. Now, if that fuel is dirty, you're gonna have challenges with getting performance. So you wanna take this opportunity because you're gathering all this information, start to clean up the data, start to understand all the places it lives in, what's authoritative for data, how, in, how much integrity do I have in data, is my title in AD really accurate, or should I look back to my HR platform for that information? And I wanna look out for vendor lock-in. I don't wanna put myself in one box and then discover later that I don't have an easy way to leverage a really amazing component that's available in another system. Because in the cloud, ideally, I work in this homogenous world where data is, is available wherever I need it. I don't need to care where it came from. I just need to know that I can access that information. Having identity data similarly ubiquitously available is critical. Now, if you're already on your way to the cloud, if you've already got a cloud first model and you're, you're down that road, it's cloud or bust, we're moving everything now as fast as we can, then you need to take into consider things like application migration. Well, your applications would love to get to the cloud and see all the identity information they used to see on premise in exactly the same format, schema, structure, authorization models that they used to have. If I can lift this information and bring with it all the fuel it needs to run, all the identity data, this works out better. I can then slowly over a migration process sunset my on-premise data centers as I lift everything in place, but I can also maintain both at the same time with the same data synchronized so that I do have operations in both locations that are using the right information and not stale data where changes made in one place don't get reflected. 
And then net going forward, everything is cloud first. All my applications are cloud-based. All my RFPs and RFIs are asking for cloud-based implementations of products. I'm looking at moving that model forward. And Radiant Logic supports this completely. We have an on-premise opportunity to run Radiant Logic. We have a hosted cloud opportunity to run Radiant Logic. We have a bring your own cloud opportunity to run Radiant Logic. So in any infrastructure you build, we can bring in this abstraction layer of Radiant Logic to make that all work for you. Now, there's some challenges in moving to this world. Uh, hybrid cloud adds additional layers of complexity. Data sources are scattered. You've got many protocols that are incompatible. Data isn't easily built into this massive model. When I had everything in Active Directory, it was easy. It was just AD. I knew where to go. But the challenge was that set of data was very narrow. I had very little granularity there. As I move into a security first posture, or our identity first security posture, excuse me, or a zero trust infrastructure, as Jonathan mentioned, as I start to get to attributes and context driving authorization, then I need to have a much richer, much more granular set of identity data. This is again where Radiant Logic comes into play. The ability to pull together that information to bring that data to play from multiple sources that are not traditionally thought of as identity data for authorization, like risk scoring or behavioral analytics or the ability to look at training and to see if someone's completed a training on a particular application before they gain access to that application. Clearance levels, whether or not they're registered for a particular profession, whether or not they have a certain amount of experience in a certain area. All these things we can glean from other non-traditional identity systems where we used to just look to AD we can aggregate now into a rich set of identity profile data for both customers and for employees and contractors and vendors and start to authorize on a much more granular level. The challenge is if you try and do this in the IDAS platforms, again, they're built to a narrow set of attributes. They have a defined schema. They didn't really anticipate or have the capacity. If you think of the scale of Azure, how many identities are in Azure? If you built that out to 150 actionable attributes that uh, update in a regular basis for every identity in Azure, Microsoft couldn't hold all that. Then you have to be able to expand the infrastructure to be able to contain that additional identity data. You need to be able to bring in radiant logic again to feed that information so that Azure gets what Azure needs, AWS gets what AWS needs, Octa gets what Octa needs. My federated apps have an endpoint single place to go for a rich set of data for policy-driven access control. My legacy applications are still waiting to move over. And I, I believe we're going to get off all the legacy applications the day after we get off the of mainframes or the day after we get rid of passwords, as Jonathan mentioned, which I think is never. So I'm still going to have to be able to service these systems. I can't leave them behind, especially in larger organizations that run their whole infrastructure on this world of legacy applications that are tightly coupled to customer manufacturing. So the key here is not only is there a way to connect to all the sources of information, but there's a tremendous amount of work being done inside Radiant Logic that's behind the covers. This is a product we've been building out for 20 years. This is a point and click, out of the box, ready to go system. It's not a scaffold where you bring in developers to write code. This is a uh, API driven, ready to go platform but it's doing a tremendous amount of work understanding the diversity of identity data, different ways that information is needed and all the challenges of correlating, aggregating, cleaning, and bringing that data and making it available when change happens across all the endpoints that need to consume that data, whether they're on-premise or in the cloud. So the key here is we're going to bring efficiency. We're going to let you see the data, clean up the data, normalize the data, deliver the data in a way that makes it much easier to consume. We're going to give you flexibility. If you decide later that you found a better access management system than the one you deployed a year ago, and you want to snap that system in, you've got one point to connect to, Radiant Logic, to get all the identity information you need. Instead of reconnecting and replumbing and rewriting all the code necessary to integrate that identity system to all the places you may have identity. Or if you get a new source of identity, you merge with another organization, you add more granularity to your authorization model, you simply snap that into Radiant, it becomes available to all the players on the field. This increases security both from availability, visibility, and the ability to actually run analytics and to do comparisons and do anomalies and, and change detection and pattern behavior analysis and tying risk scoring back to authorization for user profiles, the ability to increase the risk 
uh, agree case risk and increased security is, is excellent. And then observability, the capability of actually seeing identity data, watching it in motion, watching the drift, making sure that there aren't unauthorized changes to the system, that everything is actually operating in the way that it's intended to be. So with that, I am going to turn it back over to Becky and say thank you for listening to Radiant Logic. You will get a copy of the slides and we're more than welcome to reach out for additional information. Thank you so much, Wade. I really appreciate both you and Jonathan um, unpacking this for us. Um, before we get onto the Q&A, I just want to point everybody in the direction of our feedback survey. So please go ahead and fill that out if you have a moment. So we have a couple of questions here uh, from Miguel. Um, I'm going to let Jonathan go ahead and take a swing at these first. Uh, at this this first one, doesn't the SCIM protocol make IDM identity, identity management ubiquitous? Well, um, yeah, and um, for for the rest of us, um, SCIM stands for System for Cross Domain Identity Management, and yes, exactly what it's supposed to do. It's supposed to make identity management ubiquitous. Um, I think we're seeing greater and greater adoption. Um, you know, I'm, I know certainly the um, you know the initial vendors, Okta, CyberArk, Bing, Sable Point, SailPoint, sorry, uh, Technology Networks and Band ID, SecureAuth, uh, Salesforce. Uh, so th there's quite a list of vendors who signed up to this. Um, <clears throat> I think also we've seen you know people like Zscaler or Zscaler, um, Dropbox, uh, Perimeter eighty one have all signed up to this as a yeah as a as a standard. Um, I don't believe it's completely ubiquitous, but I do think it is, um, it's a useful standard and it's something to look at um, when you are considering which vendors to adopt. Um, Wade, I'm sure you've got a view on Skim. Yeah, we've actually adopted Skim and Radiant actually very early, Skim 1, uh, which was the original sort of narrow defined, everyone agreed, this is what first name is, this is what last name is. So I can, I can transport, uh, provisioning of identities between systems. The challenge was that like all standards and, and the bigger challenge around skim was that a lot of vendors said, that's great, but what do I call my, uh, I don't know, widget 19 identifier. So I need to extend this skim platform. So skim two became extensible. So when you start extending skim, now you're, you're writing a extension to skim that the integrator has to be able to then incorporate into their system and we support Skim2 and those extensions. Uh, we have found some integrations with, with other vendors out there to be a little bit of a challenge because the Skim protocol hasn't been built out as far as it, it should be. Um, it has some nice flexibility there, but then you see large vendors like Workday who haven't adopted this that are driving a whole HR platform with their own independent APIs. So you have to have the ability, I think, to, to work in a flexible world where you leverage Skim everywhere it's available. If I'm connecting to ServiceNow, I'm going to use Skim. They love Skim. We love Skim. It works. If I'm talking to Workday, I'm going to have to go back to their API. If I'm going to Salesforce, I'm going to pull it through Skim or potentially directly off the databases, depending on the, the work case. So it's a tool. It doesn't solve all problems because you can't be everything to everybody, but I think it gets you a lot farther down to easier integration in a lot of scenarios. And Miguel and if also. An end, so if you're an end user, sorry, go ahead, Becky. Well, Miguel just also wanted to clarify whether or not uh, Radiant Logic's uh, product was a SaaS offering. Uh, we have both a SaaS offering and we have an on-premise offering. The majority of our historical customers have been running Radiant on-premise. Um, my question to the customer always is, where are the identities and where are the applications? You want to put Radiant Logic as close to those as possible. So if you're primarily now in the cloud, then putting us up in the cloud with you running as a SaaS platform makes a lot of sense. If you've got a lot of embedded infrastructure still in your own data centers, all your data is sitting on servers in your environment, let's not add a hop to the cloud if we don't need to. So you have choices. Jonathan, I'm sorry, I cut you off. I wanted you to finish that thought. Yeah, no, it's actually, um, I wanted to uh, pick Wade Brain a little bit. Um, obviously, yep. there's some very big players out there, like Microsoft, for example. And I was curious about whether they fully support Skim or whether they're another one where you have to have a, uh, a hop, skip, and a jump widget um, to in, to adapt and interpret. Yeah, I, well, 
Um, see if I can remain politically correct here. Microsoft has always, I think, added their additional intellectual property to anything. If you look at LDAP and Active Directory, it's 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 a directory protocol, but they added functions that were Microsoft specific. I think in the case of uh, Azure AD, where you would look to see Skim to be an endpoint, they've gone to the Graph API as the method for accessing and, and populating data inside Azure. Because they have more control over it, they can map things more directly, they can extend out the, the platform to support more initiatives they have. And it's a very rich platform, so I think they need that sort of uh, complexity or, or diversity. Um, Others where it's a more straightforward integration, we see more skim. The outbound uh, model for Okta, if you want to get data out of Okta, is skim. If you want to get data into Okta, it's their proprietary connector. Challenge with skim is, though, it is not fast. It's not performant. Uh, the nature of HTTPS it is sucking data through a straw. So it's good for small incremental things. But if you're trying to bring a whole directory infrastructure out over skim, you could be waiting a while. So what happens in the event of a breach like Okta, which happened recently? How, how does Radiant Logic react to that? And how does that help teams identify potential threats? Well, there's, there's a number of areas where um, you can leverage Radiant Logic to, to assist in that scenario. One of the things that we have the ability to do is aggregating risk scores from multiple risk engines. So we have the ability to tag uh, data coming in from like a proof point that does behavioral analytics, watching you over six months to see if you're you're planning to leave the organization because you all of a sudden started downloading a lot of files onto your local machine, um, or uh, looking at edge device uh, coming in from a risky endpoint, or what we call a break glass score, which is saying, okay, I got a breach at Okta. I'm going to actually hit a button and close off the Okta data to everybody in the organization from a central point. Because I'm a, a, a switching yard, I'm a point of aggregation for this data, I can decide to isolate um, a source at, at will across the organization. Or if I get ransomware on my network, I can go ahead and, and trigger software-defined perimeter parameters that stops all east-west traffic in my organization immediately so I can make sure that whatever Trojans are running across my environment don't get to propagate. So the ability to react to an outside event and apply that in a global model without tearing the house down gives you a lot of uh, opportunities to react in that kind of scenario. Excellent. Well, um, I think that's just about the time, all the time we have. I want to open this up for both Jonathan and Wade to give us some final thoughts. Jonathan, do you want to take just a few minutes to help wrap this up for today? I think one of the things that um, I've seen and um, I've got a friend who is a security manager at one of the big cloud service providers, um, can't obviously say who, um, and he said identity is the thing that they really worry about when they have a security event that is identity related, even if it's something as simple as an endpoint being stolen, which has obviously you know cookies and uh, access tokens cached in order to access you know, the cloud provider services. They really worry about that. Um, and I think that identity has become a really important plank, especially in cloud, where we're now talking about things like identity first security strategies. Um, well, I think it's good that we are focusing on identity. I think that we need to bring in additional controls as well. We need to get back to the idea that we had I'm sure you remember this as well, Wade, the idea of defense in depth, where we weren't focusing just on a control or a set of controls. We were thinking, well, what else can we do to supplement and augment our primary control set? Thank you very much for that, Jonathan. Wade, do you have any final thoughts for us before we wrap up today? Yeah, I want to leave everyone with an encouraging thought. Um, and Jonathan mentioned earlier that historically in our industry, we built these giant monolithic solutions that we promised if you buy this big box, it will solve all your problems and I'll deploy it in three weeks and you'll never need identity infrastructure again. And that never worked and it wouldn't responsibly be expected to work. But what we've started to do as an industry is actually admit to our customers, there is no one product, there is no one solution. This is an aggregation of multiple solutions and it's a journey towards 
an ever more secure, ever more usable, ever more frictionless environment for our users and our customers. So wherever you are today in your infrastructure, don't give up, don't, don't lose hope, start to incrementally make changes going forward. You already have tools in your hands you can use to expand your security premise. You can bring in new resources and incrementally increase the security model that you have to make things more frictionless for users to add layers of control. It's an evolutionary journey. We're on it together. We're gonna to continue to get better and better tools to help you, but do plan now for how you're gonna take this journey, understand where you are, and then decide where you wanna to get to and then look out for the best people to help you do that. Thank you. Thank you again, both Jonathan and Wade. Dark Reading really appreciates your time and your deep expertise on this subject. We want to thank our sponsor, Radiant Logic, as well as everyone in the audience. We appreciate your attention and your participation. Within the next 24 hours, you'll receive a personalized follow up email with details and a link to today's presentation on demand. Please feel free to invite your colleagues and peers who might not have been able to listen to the event live. This webinar is copyright 2023 by Informa. The presentation materials are owned by or copyrighted by Dark Reading and Radiant Logic, and the individual speakers are solely responsible for their content and their opinions. With that, on behalf of our guests, I'm Becky Bracken. Thank you so much, and I hope everybody has a great day.